depending on what's a pretty miserable night, and I suspect a lot of us are suffering with a degree of nerves about the possible tomorrow's match. Um, before I go any further, Pete Martin has very kindly agreed to film tonight's meeting. If anyone doesn't want to be filmed and put out to an audience of millions, <laughs> can you either make it known to Pete or disguise yourselves appropriately? <laughs> Since the AGM last month, I, for my sins, have been appointed as chairman again in the coming year. Again, that is a role which I feel privileged to hold. The AGM this year, you will recall, Julian Tagg did a presentation to the meeting, but unfortunately, Keith Mason, the club financial director, wasn't able to attend. So what I said at that meeting was that I would get Keith to a forum so that he could answer questions and give a presentation to you about the financial situation of the club. In terms of format tonight, I'm going to invite Keith to introduce himself, tell you a little about himself, and then to give a presentation followed by any questions you may have. We'll then have a break in which I hope some raffle tickets will be purchased. And then I thought rather than me coming back up here and taking questions from the floor, I would simply stay and I'll mingle and I'll answer any questions um, rather than make it a, a formal setting. Before I hand over to Keith, some of you will know that I am a recent convert to Twitter. Uh, and like all converts, I have embraced it with an evangelical enthusiasm. And I was sitting in court earlier in the week, and frankly I should have been concentrating on my case, but instead I was just catching up on tweets. And I stumbled upon a tweet which reads as follows. Forest Green Rovers losses from the 1st of May 2013 to the 30th of April 2015, equal £5,372. In that time, they gained 146 league points at a cost of £36,798 a co uh, point. Now, Dale Vince is a very wealthy man, in spite of having incurred some heavy costs in the Supreme Court recently and a, hef a hefty divorce settlement and he may be a man who can afford to fund the club on that basis. Um, whether that's a sustainable model or not, I think is a different question, and I hope not the model that our finances are based on. So I'm hoping that at the very least Keith will tell us that we're not spending £36,798 on every point that we get. So... Well, we just spent five and a half million. <laughs> With some confidence on that, I will be over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence, and uh, welcome to ladies and gentlemen. Um, just a little bit about myself. Um, you probably may have already picked up that I was born and bred in Yorkshire. Um, I've lived in the southwest for 25 years now. Um, unfortunately, you, well, you'll probably think of it, unfortunately, because I was uh, born in Yorkshire. I, at a very early age, became a Leeds United fan, and as you will all know, that stays with you, doesn't it? <laughs> where you're brought up is where you support the football team. So, whilst I enjoy watching football all over the place, um, my heart still in Leeds as far as football is concerned. And yes, I was here three years ago, and yeah, it was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> That's football, isn't it? We've all had to endure of that. Um, on a personal basis, as I say, I've lived down here for, for 25 years. Uh, I've probably settled down here and I've got uh, a daughter and two sons uh, who are all grown up now. Um, as far as work is concerned, um, I, I've worked in accountancy all of my life. Um, in, whilst I lived in Yorkshire, I worked in uh, manufacturing all of the time since I've come down to Devon. I've worked in construction all of the time. and. Uh, Currently, I'm finance director of Southwest Highways, who I'm sure you all know, dig up the roads and pavements all over Devon, um, and I've worked for them for 20 years. Um, I was invited a year or so ago 
uh, by David Lee, who I've worked with for a long, long time. Um, he asked me if I'd be prepared to have a look at some of the things that the board were, um, w would like a bit further investigation on. And I did a, a few weeks work working with uh, Guy at that time. Um, I put a proposal to the board about some of the things that if I were finance director, I'd look to change. Um, that presumably went down reasonably well because when Steve decided he'd had enough and wanted to pack it in, they asked me if I'd be interested in this role. And um, I, I, from a personal point of view, the timing wasn't great for me because I've got, as I said, I've got a full time job. But um, I'm not too far away from retirement, and, and I see this is a job I would love to do um, once I reach retirement. So I decided now was the time to pitch in and, and take it on, and I look to do it for many years if you allow me to do that. Um, so that's a, that's a bit about myself. Um, I'm, I'm here tonight to answer any questions that, that you've got. I've got a couple of sheets of paper in front of me of questions that have already been set, so if you don't mind, I'd like to, s to start off with these. By all means, chip in at when, if you've got any questions around the subject that we're talking about while I'm talking, and, um, and, I'll, and I'll do the best I can. I'm sure you're aware that I've only been in this role for about six months. Just in time to come along to answer any questions that I might not know about because they're a little bit previous to, to my role, but um, I've done a bit of revision before I came here, so hopefully I'll be okay. Um, I'll start with some questions that, um, that Roger Vivi has asked because he emailed Lauren Sapp the AGM with a series of questions. So if you don't mind, I'll start with those, I'll answer those, and then I'll say, if anybody wants to chip in at any time, do so. When I get to the end of these, by all means, ask me any question that you want. Okay. Uh, Roger's first question was, assuming that a break-even budget was set for the year ended 31st of May 2015, excluding windfalls, i.e. Warrington TV and Bank of Grimes, what cost overruns occurred in what amount in each area of the club business? What profit stroke loss will be reported in the statutory accounts? <coughs> How much Grimes money is included? How much depreciation is included? And what actions have been taken to eliminate cost overruns? <coughs> I'd like to first of all e explain something about statutory accounts because the people who understand the accounts in, in this room will realise that statutory accounts and management accounts are two completely different things. They're all based on exactly the same information, so there's no double sets of books going on or anything funny like that, but it's all about timings. Statutory accounts have got certain rules that have to be abided by. They're set by the government, by tax authorities, and by accountancy bodies to ensure that compliance, accuracy, and consistency is maintained. So statutory accounts have got certain rules. One of the rules is that in a football club, all transfers in and out have to be accounted for at the date the contract is signed. So all of the grants money the club received, will receive, sorry, all of the grants transfer money has to go in last year's statutory accounts. The club doesn't want to manage its business in that way. It wants to feed that money into, uh, into, into the books. So the timing of the money is completely different, which is why you're going to get discrepancies between statutory accounts and management accounts. I've, I've received a draft set of the management accounts today from the, the auditors. They're not totally complete, there's one or two queries, but the statutory accounts will show more than likely between one and a half and 1.6 million profits for the last financial year. That's nowhere near the sorts of figures we're showing in the management accounts, and that's all to do with time. So, that, it's important that you understand the, the difference and, 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 and the way that the club manages its finances through the management accounts is completely different to how the statutory accounts say. <coughs> Has anybody got any questions on that particular point? Have you been paid to all the 1.76 million? No, the agreement was uh, that, that it's going to be paid in four quarters. First quarter on the date of the transfer, so January 15th, then August 15th, 
January 16 and August 16. So why do you have to put it in the accounts? What because that's what the rules say. The transaction was done on that date. It, it, it's, it's merely that the payment schedule is different. It, it's, it's similar to running a business and giving people credit. If you sell something to them today, but you don't expect them to be paid for it until the end of December, still goes in your books today. Uh, we, we were asked a question on the trust pool on Saturday, which I said I'd raise today. Um, the, the question really was that from looking at the accounts, I think that, that were flashed up at the AGM, it didn't look like they were equal amounts for quarters, and they were a bit baffled by that and wondered, looking at the amounts of money um, that, that, well, that, that was shown, okay. it didn't seem to add up to what we were expecting it to add up to. Okay. Well, the, certainly the amounts of money that are received from Swansea are equal quarters. But what the board did um, was to, to look at how the club would best benefit from that money. And there's a rough rule of thumb to say something like a third will go into the players' budgets, a third will go into the Clifford Hill Centre, and a third will be retained by the club. Um, that amount of money retained by the club will be used to pay off loans and other creditors, but also to finance the ongoing working capital. <coughs> I say they're loose figures, but then when you look at the breakdown of that, the, the, the third that went into the players' budget, for example, small proportion of that was allocated to the last financial year because there were only four months left. A big chunk is going into this financial year, a smaller chunk into the, next, into the following financial year. As far as the Clifford Hill Centre is concerned, nothing out of nothing was spent up to the end of May. A bit of money's gone on the pitches in this financial year. The bulk of the money will, it will be spent next year. So, so that's well, probably that, why you've got those discrepancies. When when that capital project takes off, so it, it becomes fruition, so that's allocated and then wants to reserve it, but will get released again to that subject. Yeah. Yeah. Is that okay? Can I can I clarify on the 2015-16 budget? We've got allocation of energy transfer 420,000. Yes. That looks like only one quarter. One quarter. One quarter of of. Can the you have two quarters in there? No, because we're not allocating all of the money the club receives. We're allocating more money the club the thinks spending. should be given to the manager to supplement the squad. So this is the difficulty with it, isn't it? We know with the. The statutory account has got one chunk of money in on day one. The cash flow has got four quarters every six months. And the management accounts have got different bits all over the place for different projects. And part of the reason for that, Roger, is, is trying to make sure that underneath it all, the club's maintained the space. So if, if it can release these funds in, the match against the expenditure, the place yeah, under the will remain consistent. Yeah. And just, just to clarify one thing you said about uh, the deal with Grimes crystallises, so you have to put it in the statutory account to yes. complete the sale. Yep. That sale is completely uncontingent in terms? There are no contingencies? I, I personally that? don't know the details of, of the deal. Do, so you, do you know so any better? So the undisclosed sum, sorry, uh, but that, that undisclosed sum is, is unconditional. Okay, yeah. There are a number of other conditions that could be sure. achieved, but that, that sum is it's it's less than And it's a public creditor, yeah. um, and that will remain completely paid. Okay, yeah, thanks. Yeah, okay. The other part of that question was about um, windfalls and other, other variances in, uh, in the books against budget. Um, as, as you would expect, there are, there are always a number of variances. You do a budget to the best of your ability, but things change. So um, there were a number of areas where there were variances. At the end of the day, they virtually balanced off, but things like League and Cup um, receipts were up, TV money was up, obviously. The Warrington game was on the TV, that significantly helped. Commercial income was down a little bit. Um, shop income was up, bars and kiosks was down. Um, the, the wages were up because the manager was given more money to spend once the grants money came in. And there was a significant saving on the ground. Um, a, a large budget was put in for repairs to the ground, but with the redevelopment going on, it was decided that wasn't necessary. So I say lots of ups and downs, but 
they just about balanced out at the end of the day. The other major saving in the parish is thanks to everyone who could work on the on the right. park. So the yeah. floodlights we put in full of costs but um, following the fund base and we wanted to source and self fund those floodlights. And how much were the wages up? The wage the wages were up in total last year, if I remember rightly, a couple of hundred thousand was it? But that was uh, that, that's all wages and salaries. Um, the great majority of that was agreed increases to the players' budget because of the funding from uh, from the grants transfer. Um, any other questions about about question number one? Roger's second question was, is it still policy to set a break-even budget? If so, why was the loss projected for 15-16 at 49,000 and 469, including the Grimes money? Well, we should ignore the 469 because that's just a confusion. Um, the, having said that, though, the statutory accounts in this year will show 469 loss because we've already taken the Grimes money last year. But the, the management accounts... We did originally set a budget of, um, of a small profit, but um, b because of um, additional expenditure through the players' budgets at the end, right at the end of August, if you remember, two players were signed later on, Joe Grant and Clinton Morrison, that actually took the players' budget a little bit more than the budget that we'd set. However, um, we, we, we felt that that wasn't going to be a problem and has proved it won't be a problem because the extra funding that we've received from the cup games at Sunderland and Plymouth <coughs> and the TV money uh, from Dean Cotts and others have already paid for that overspend there and um, one of the things we do as, as our natural process in preparing the management accounts is to, is to do a prediction to year end, something that we call a LEO, latest expected outturn, and taking that into account and the overspend on, on the players' budget, we, we're back now predicting that there will be a small profit at the end of the year, round about the 25,000 we started with. Is the, is the club going to put that TV money into a really paid rainy day account, or are they going to spend it? Squid? Yeah, <laughs> spend it. Um, um, spend it. Some of, it, some of it is spent because the, because the player budget um, has finished up a little bit higher than we would have hoped. But uh, at the end of the day, you prepare a budget, you run the club as best you can, and, and you do what you can with it. Um, if there is an opportunity to ring fence some of that, then we will do. Um, but there is no laid down plan, if you like, to say we've received X amount of money, we're going to put that in that pot. Uh, we, we manage things as, as we go along, month by month, we manage things and uh, you know, there, are, there are a number of areas that uh, that, that might be useful. So. If I'm David Thompson. Um, I wasn't going to interject, but as you are the financial director, everything falls down to figures. Yes. Now, in Lawrence's opening comments and your opening comments, if I read you both correctly, I get the impression that football clubs are very good at spending money, <coughs> but not so good at raising it. If you're a Leeds United supporter through thick and thin, you know exactly Absolutely, what I'm talking about. Yes. And if you're a bold wanderer supporter, you know what I was talking about. And if you're a little talk United supporter down the road, you'd also know what I was talking about. Yeah. Hence my submission, which you haven't looked at yet. But okay, on, this, I was to it on this business of employment figures. Yeah. Employment costs, that's what I majored on. I went to the AGM, the figures were flashed off very quickly. They're not here this evening for me to be absolutely precise on, but they went up quickly. I looked at the employment costs, and the employment costs as per the trust website and the club website for the year ending May 2014 were two, just over two million, 2012. Right. Now, the Wages and salaries for 2014-15, we were shown at the AGM, were 2.4 million, an increase of 19.28%. The projected uh, salaries and wages for 2015-16, I noted them down quickly, so I may have been wrong, I've noted them down as 2.783 million. 
Now, if my figures are correct, that means year on year, if we go back to the year ending 2014, the club has increased its wages and salaries by 38.32% at a time when gates have been falling and at a time when it says that it's quite reliant on gate income. So as a lifetime supporter of this club, I'm anxious that it doesn't go into administration again. Yeah. I don't want to feel the pain that my friends, I know that's all they are feeling at the moment. But at the end of the day, those <coughs> figures, that I, if you put the two <coughs> years together, it's an increase of 1.1 million. So yeah. putting a hat on, I thought, well, okay, we spent the Grimes money. We may or may not have done. I think we, in, in cases of, we probably have. Um, but if we have, and I just happen to have, the 2005-06 pro one program for that year, it shows two things. The average gates were 3,964. <coughs> we're in the conference then. Our lowest gate was 3,026. Our lowest gate this season so far is 2,883 for Cambridge United. And incidentally, if you look at the under 11 list in here, you will find the name of Matthew Grimes. He was here in 2005-2006. Or the present management team took over again. Now, what I'm saying to you is it takes a very long time to secure that asset. Yeah. And that I've done very little as far as this club is concerned, but I know an awful lot of volunteers. I have contributed funds occasionally along the line. People have contributed a lot more than me in time, money, and effort. And at the end of the day, I think we owe it to them to make sure that this club is run properly. And the real concern for me, as I said in my paper, I find it very disquieting that the trust didn't realise that the club needed to be going to the PFA for a £100,000 loan. When the trust took over this club, when everyone else had disappeared, they were in control and most supporters were comfortable with that. And in the invitation I've had tonight, it says at the bottom, the logo is, we own our football club. So the question I want answered is, do we? And on the basis of these financial figures, I am concerned. Right. Okay. Well, what I can say is any increases in wages and salaries last year and this year are entirely down to the fact that the club has got the grant transfer money and the manager has been given additional budget to, to use that money in the best way that he can. He's also very aware that He's got more money this year than he's going to get next year because his money runs out next year. And the year after, he gets no money. So the level of wages that the club had prior to January 2015, without there is other money available to the club, either through a promotion or through the sale of other players, the manager's players budget will be back down to December 14 levels when it gets to 2016, 17 season. And he knows that and is aware of it. And are we confident that that can be turned off? Yes. I wonder if, you, if I just perhaps come back on the second point, because yeah. I think that was particularly relevant to the trust. <coughs> um, the PFA loan that was taken out as the trust publicised at the time was taken out on the authority of the cash flow meeting. And at that meeting, there was no trust representative present. That led to the trust making a public statement, asking the club to acknowledge that it was wrong, that that decision was made and authority given without there being some kind of sanction by the trust first. What happened after that, I think, is history, but it led to some fairly fundamental changes in the governance model at the club. It made certainly the shift to where the decision-making process lies from operational meetings such as ca cash flow meetings to the club board, which have now, of course, has equal trust representation on it. I think there is another point, and that is, it is perhaps wrong to look back to a golden age 
the fact of the matter is, and I, it certainly before my tenancy on either the trust or the board, that loans had been taken out previously, and without them being made public to the FAs. Now, the one thing the trust was resolved to do about the PFA loan was not to hide it, was to go public and to say, this loan has been taken, and we are not happy in the circumstances it was taken out with. Now, we will face battles in the future, doubtless running a football club will always be a challenge. But I do like to think that the trust met that problem head on and dealt with it as best as it could. And that certainly the days of decisions being made in meetings where there is no trust representative present have well and truly gone. Can, can I just make one, one other uh, point about cash flow? Um, it, it's, it's probably a bit more than a year ago that I first got involved with, uh, with the football club. And, and one of the things that staggered me was that regular cash flow forecasts were not presented to the board at every board meeting. Uh, and that's something that has changed since I took over. We now have a system internally within the accounts team that, that we know every Monday morning exactly how much money we had in the bank on a Friday night. And from, from my point of view, it doesn't matter how much <coughs> money uh, a football club makes in profits, how much losses it makes, football clubs run on cash in the bank. This particular football club runs on cash in the bank because it won't get any money from a bank in the form of a bank overdraft. The only way this club will get any more money than what it generates is from loans from benefactors of, of the football club or from PFA loans. And I will do my damnedest to make sure we don't have to borrow money from anybody. Uh, as, as, as you said earlier, I've learned the hard way being a supporter of Leeds United. You've, you've got to have cash in the bank to run a football club. So I, I, th that, that's my stance on it. You need to know exactly where you are with the cash and where that cash is, and not only what you've got today, yesterday, today, tomorrow, but how much you're going to get in next week, uh, the week after, and the month after. And the other thing that's happened in, in recent months is we now project the cash flow for the next six months. So if we can see that in February next year, we think we're going to have a problem with cash, we can put a plan in place today to make sure we don't have a problem in February next year. Yes, sir. Uh, I'll take the one at the back first, if you don't mind. Yeah, he was talking about crowds going down from 3-9. Um, I think the one of the biggest things that happened recent seasons, two seasons ago, it was the price of the tickets going up, where I saw people that said, thanks to me, since that stands open, give up their season tickets and not return them. Um, as a disabled supporter, I saw my ticket go up twice the amount that uh, um, an adult could pay, um, where the pensions, even though the government say they give you two and a half percent, but that's not only your private pensions, it's on that little bit get from the post office. So that was one thing, and that was done by our friend from the, uh, the country the cricket club. Secondly, on the defence of the both the, the trust and the board of directors, I sit on the um, Grecian Group Forum, and I've never seen them in such a happy place as they are now. They're working together to, to get a lot of the points changed. They've got people that are responsible for certain things one for the board, one for the, for the trust. And we had some very happy meetings with it. everyone singing from the same page you know. Sure. I was going to say, if you did forecast um, cash flow problems ahead for six months' time, yeah. and you need to put a plan in place to stop that, I'm just wondering what actually could be done with contracts having been signed and that sort of thing. Yeah. But what, if that is there to be true and if that arises, well, the, the, yeah, there are a number of things you could you could do. You're quite right. You've got players on contracts, and they are long-term contracts. First, the first thing I would look at was, can we actually collect the money that we're owed quicker than we're currently doing? Because there's always a amount of money owed to the club 
Um, so that's the first place that you look, and, and you do what you can on that. If you manage to do that and you still can't achieve what you have to achieve, then you've, you've got to look at other things. Can we reduce our spending in the next three months so we don't actually have to pay out as much? Can we actually look at some of the creditors and maybe squeeze them a little bit harder and delay their payment for a few weeks to get to a stage where we have got some money to spare? So you look at all of those things first. Is that not stuff that we should be doing anyway? We, yes, but, but you've got to strike a balance. You know, you can only squeeze a little bit out of your creditors <coughs> if you've got a good rapport with them. If you pay them roughly to normal terms most of the time, if you've got a bit of a problem, you can ring one or two up and say, the check's going to be a couple of weeks late this time. If you always squeeze them as hard as you can, it's difficult to make that call when you need to make it. So you've got to strike a balance. But yeah, in essence, that, that's what you can do. The absolute last resort is you'd have to go to the manager and say, can you get a couple of players out on loan? Can we, can we save some money? Can we get some money back? But at least if you know that you've got that to look at in three, four months' time, you can plan for it. Yeah? Peter, I think what you're saying there is that it isn't really the right thing you can do, isn't it? Well, there's lots you can do, <laughs> but, but you are... You are you can squeeze a creditor, that's money gone, isn't it? It is. You're not going to get it again. Yeah, absolutely. But I'm, I'm not talking about a situation where you quote a million likes or something like that. You're talking generally where you've got your swings and roundabouts in your cash flow. You're talking about maybe having a ten or twenty thousand pound hole. So it's not difficult to fill. If if we were going to go quarter a million overdrawn, then you've got to find some really drastic measures to take. But. Um, Hard to think it would be a quarter of a million without some disaster. Absolutely right, and, and, and uh, I don't anticipate that. And, and at no stage in any of the cash flows that we've done are we anywhere near that. In fact, there are, I think, if I remember rightly, in the next six months, there are only two places, as we call them, pinch points, where money is tight, um, and, and they, are, they are manageable easily. So I don't anticipate any problems for at least the next six months cash flow-wise. Oh, sorry. Um, hi, can I just um, go back to these points about the projected loss? So we were projecting a loss of about 50,000 on yes. the ADM. Yes. Yeah. Uh, disregarding grant money at this point. Yeah. Was that, that, from what I think you said, that was, was that before the additional spend of bringing a couple of extra players? No, that was after that spend. That spend. After that. So we were expecting then to say, right, the, the manager and the club san sanctioned a projected shortfall for the season of 50 pounds. Yeah. And given that we knew we'd already allowed for the grants money in that, so if we had had the grants money, obviously there wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to do something we did, but Absolutely. if we said that, we were effectively saying we would be looking at losing nearly 500,000. Well. Well, you're adding the grants money. Well, yeah, if you add back the grants money, but, but you're never going to be in that situation because without the grants money, the manager would never have been allowed to push his player budget up to that level. Okay, so, so we're back to this 50,000. Yeah. We knew we were going to have a shortfall on. Yeah. We didn't know if we were going to have any more windfalls. We didn't know if we were going to have any more cut run money, yeah. especially with our record in cuts. Yeah. Um, or I didn't improve on. <coughs> but. We were immediately starting the sea, starting the year, saying we're going to lose money. So yeah. where is that money going to come? We, we yeah. just, we're saying about having cash flow. Yeah. Make sure we don't have pinch points. Make sure yeah. we've got the money. So, but we're yeah. starting the year harnessing ourselves for the yeah. debt. Okay. If you remember when I when I talked about the grinds money, we said roughly a third goes to the manager. Yeah. And a third, the third that goes to the manager is all the gets. So if he overspends this year by fifty grand, he's got fifty grand less next year. If he's only got a pot of so much. So you, you're effectively then you're taking money out of next year's budget. To he, he's, we, we call these extra funds that we've got from the grants money windfalls. Yeah. So the windfall that the manager has been given this year, if he overspends on that, then it has to come out of next year because he's only got one pot to spend. Right. So, so we're now saying, because well, we've we now had some cut funds, yeah. and a bit of extra income that we weren't yeah. expecting. Yeah. So is that money going into <coughs> support that fifty thousand loss, or is it is it being used to offset what we might have dipped into next year? I don't believe that a final decision has been made by the board 
to answer that question. I, I, I'm not, I don't think the board have agreed that an extra lump of money can be put in the player's pot from the, from, from the grounds of money. I think it's probably likely that, w that it would be because at the end of the day, any football club is, is really run to give the manager as much money as he can to put the best p p team on the pitch. Yeah, so it's also we've got to be run, especially in the moment we're in, has to not go fast. Absolutely, and and, that, and that's why I say <coughs> that that the the, ex, the the 50 loss would have been covered either by the the TV money or the extra game money this year, or it comes out of next year's players' budget. It can't just be allowed and to say you've got an extra. And we wouldn't be allowed to dip into other reserves well, that are earmarked. It, 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 it could be. It could be. I mean, the board could make the decision that they want to take 50,000 out of the Clifford Hill project to, to give to the manager if they felt that was the right thing to do. But you could, you know, you're then affecting some, another part of the business. If, for example, when the, the, the Clifford Hill project is properly costed out and there's a 50,000 save, potential saving in that, you could divert that into the player budget. So, but, but then from what, from what Lawrence has said, any decision about that type of movement of money yep. would have to be taken not at a small committee meeting but at a full board full meeting. Full board meeting, right? absolutely right. Yeah. Uh, at which there's equal representation between the trust and the, and the other directors. Okay. So, yeah. so, okay, so I, I, I think I understand now that we're projecting a loss, as of the figures that were presented to us, yes. we're projecting a loss of 50,000, but because we know we've got that money in the reserve, We'll, we'll, if necessary, we'll pull it out of that. So yeah, yeah. deplete next year. So well, it's, it's, it's not actually in a reserve because it's money that's been earned this year. Yeah, so well, from my point of view, it's not a reserve yeah. put aside, it's, it's designated to be used next year, but we can pull it back in this year if we need to. Well, actually, the, the extra, the extra money that the club has received this year is this year's income. So what that means is that whilst we have spent a bit more on the player budget than we thought we would, We've also got more money from Cupgate cup receipts, and we've got more money from TV money. So the, 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 the projection at the, at the AGM of a 50 loss has already changed to a profit because right. of events that's happened but since. That, that is what I'm trying to get to the point is, we know we can't rely on things like that. We can't rely on, we can't rely on Absolutely. us sending another player for no. money. We can't no. rely on cut like no. I if we had to play big drop had it on the TV, yeah. we wouldn't have had that much Absolutely money. right. And that is why when we, when the budget is done, the budget the bu the budget has, if I remember rightly, uh, Justin, the last two years the budget has included twelve thousand pounds of TV money, no more than that. Yeah, I mean, radio income, which is a fixed contract yeah, yeah. for a TV money. Yeah. TV yeah. Radio, yeah. 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 And we budget for one cup game in each competition. So if we do better than that, then it's a bonus to the budget. And we hopefully are never in a situation where we over budget for things like TV money and corporate pay receipts. Yeah. Can I, can I just add something? Uh, one thing that people may not know is that because of the way the, both the JPT and the FA, early on the FA Cup are done, it really doesn't matter in terms of income whether that, that game's away or at home because yeah. you both get, you get an equal share. Yeah, but so, you can, so, so you, it's saved the budget for one cup game. Yeah. And you will get half. You will get forty five percent of the game. Whatever, yeah. Whatever but it, it's the TV money, which is the yeah. added, which is the TV bonus. Really. Right. And, and, a, and a cup win is a double bonus because you get a, you normally get some money for winning a cup game, and you get another game. <coughs> so so you know the the, the budget. You could argue the budget is a little bit pessimistic on on that front, but it's the right way to do a budget. But it, it, it still concerns me that we are. I think you touched on it earlier on, that we were setting a level budget. We yes. were going to have a break even. Yes, we were. But to start the year saying, and, yeah. and I know we can say, well, we've got a bit of money that we can draw back on, yeah. but should we not be looking to say we must live we, within our means? We, we, I, I absolutely agree, and we should always say we live within our means. But we are in a slightly different situation at the moment, in, in that we have got this big pot of windfall, and the manager has been given his share of that. The worst case scenario would have been that by overspending this year's budget, he's got less for next year. If, or, if we or, well, the worst case scenario is he would also have clawed in the money from the Clifford Hill side 
from the cash flow side. Well, that, that wouldn't have been his choice, though. No, but that would have been a board choice if, if, if they felt that that was yeah, the right way I'm, to I'm go. I'm not looking particularly just at the, the playing side, but the club as a whole. Yeah. I don't know the wages and the playing side the biggest thing. But we're saying that basically that money that we hoped was going to be used for specific ideas, for specific things which we couldn't do, and, and it's been covered previous years about like not having a good cash flow, you yeah. not having a good strong balance sheet, so we were going to use some of that money to support that. Yeah. So we were potentially saying um, that, that all that money could be just crawled back in and blown in, in well, a year or two. Yeah, yeah you could take that point, but you, you've, got to, you've got to give the board credit that they, they, that they can, can run a business like this and they will make sensible decisions, and it wouldn't have been sensible to have moved all the money from the Clifford Hill Pot and put it into the player budget. I'm talking about a, a small adjustment if, if necessary. And for the right reasons. You know, none of us want to give a manager a bottomless bit of money to spend because we'll go spend it. There's no doubt about that. So you've got, you've got to keep a, a reasonably tight rein on him. But on the other hand, if he, if he thinks there's that player there that just might make the difference and, and he comes to the board and can say he's going to spend a little bit more money, you've got to think seriously about that as well. Yes, sir. Oh, this is quickly because I think Joel Brown was on the page mentioned. Is he one of the 1931 farm And if so, well, shouldn't that be outside of? Isn't that like ring, ring fence money? That's, in that's way, a bit of what we just. So, so 1931 means <coughs> a amount of money towards his wage costs. Okay, so it's not it's actually, actually yeah. specifically towards a specific player. Just so using the pot. Yeah, it, it comes in. It's released. So 1931 agrees part fund towards Joel's wages, but they don't cover the whole. Right. Okay. Wages. Okay. Um, I think Roger, the next three of your questions were about Grimes, and I think we've probably covered most of that now. Yeah, yeah. probably that. Yeah, okay. The next question um, Julian Tag gave an apparently contradictory answer on professional costs at the AGM. He said that redevelopment was at no cost and no risk to the club but also refer to the spending of professional fees. What costs were incurred in the year ended 31st of March 2015 on matters relating to the development? And what is the projection for such costs in the year ended 31st of May 2016? Um, well, yes, I mean, I think, as I understand it, uh, H. Alton first said that this redevelopment would be at no cost and no risk to the club. Unfortunately, that wasn't an accurate statement. They, they, they're not mutually in agreement. You can't have no risk and no cost. The, the club ha has to make sure that it's on a firm footing legally with anything like this. And certain professional costs were incurred that made sure that the club was at no risk. So um, in the accounts to May 2015, 28,000 pounds has been spent on legal fees and there will be a similar amount of fees in this current year um, to, to, just to make sure that the club is, is not at risk. One of the big areas, not big areas spent, but one of the areas that need, needed to be looked at closely was um, whether the club might be at risk of a tax bill for getting a perceived benefit on something it doesn't own. And that's not something that I or anybody else in the club knows enough about. So we, we've taken <coughs> legal advice on that. There's, there's a new stand going to be built that is of a benefit to the club, will generate more income to the club, but it doesn't own it as such because it doesn't own the ground. So you have to check the legal aspects of that and whether there is a tax implication. And the feedback that we've got back is that there, there wouldn't be any, any tax paid on that. But you couldn't afford to take that risk of, of not checking it out legally and then finishing up with what could be a several hundred thousand pound tax bill. So I'm sorry to say that that was a wrong statement and costs have been incurred. But as far as I'm told, once the redevelopment starts, there is no more cost to the club. I and I don't believe any more costs will be incurred now. We just haven't had the final bill from the solicitors. I think it's fair to say that the, the tax is replicated in a number of areas to make sure the club is safeguarding and it's getting good value for money out of the project. But in addition to that, I would add that it would, you know, left in the summer of 20, trying to get the news right on that. 14, 
so therefore, as a result of, at the point in that time, I think you, you would probably be fair to say, it, but in terms of how the project has progressed since then, and the speed it's taken, has, has allowed the club to make great progress. However, in order to protect and safeguard its asset, or lack of asset, we could be whichever way, um, in making sure that it's got best value out of this project, it's had to take a number of steps um, through legal advisors to make sure that it's getting, firstly, good advice, but secondly, using that professional indemnity should something go against the grain. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions on that? We're all okay with it? Mm -hmm. the, uh, the next question is about um, the, the Brazil trip and what current costs have been incurred by the club and what will be included in the club accounts. Uh, the answer is there is virtually no cost to the club of, of the Brazil trip. All the people who went on the trip paid their own way um, and costs incurred by the club were covered by sponsors. I won't say there's nothing, but it, it, it's in the hundreds of pounds, certainly not a thousand pounds. And anything incurred is in last year's accounts. Um, Roger's final question. Why is the club not able to present its accounts for the year end at 31st of May 2015 in, in time for the Trust AGM in mid-October? Can we please have financial screenshots of the financial numbers sent out in future as part of the AGM package? Um, I have to say that, uh, that, that uh, I'm equally disappointed about the timescales for the, for the statutory accounts. It's not something I'm used to. At Southwest Highways, we have to have our accounts audited and a draft set of accounts prepared within five weeks of year end. I don't consider we could do that in Exeter City Football Club, but there's no reason why it should take as long as it's taken. I've had a draft set of accounts today from the auditors, which is five months after the year end. This won't happen again. We will get the accounts done quicker. I'll be aiming next year to get them completed within three months of year end and hopefully even earlier than that in the years after. So you should have a set of statutory accounts available for the AG. Yeah? yeah okay. um, and as far as the, the financial numbers being sent out before the, the meeting, that's fine. There's no reason why that shouldn't be done and we, we ought to be able to, to, to achieve that. We certainly had at the, the pack ready several days before the meeting so uh, there's no reason why we couldn't do that next year. I think that's the end of yours, Roger. <laughs> Not I'm the end of that. That's enough for me. <laughs> Anything else? Any, anybody wants to pick up on any of those? Can I just ask a local question? Yeah, as many as you want. Yeah. Is there any reason why we present just a total uh, wages cost and don't break it down into? different areas of public um, I was asked to prepare stuff for the AGM in the same format as the previous year. That wasn't <laughs> so, I know it wasn't. So that's why you didn't get the detail. Um, I think we've got to be careful with wages and salaries that, you know, we can't be giving individual figures no. out. And some departments are of one person. So, you know, the, but, but I wouldn't have any objection to, to, to sitting down with a few people and agreeing what sort of department level we look at so we could break that down. So we could, for example, have commercial department, finance department, players' wages, um, I, I don't know, some, some of the others. So we could, we could break it down to some six or so different departments I, I wouldn't have thought it was unreasonable. I think that would head off quite a lot of the silly speculation. Yeah, yeah. Are we able to split the wages from expenses? Yes. As, what, what do you mean by expenses? Uh, well, just uh, travel costs. Uh, yeah, <coughs> yeah. We, 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 we have, the, these guys will tell you, we, we have quite a detailed set of management accounts that, um, that, that break all sorts of things down into fairly, fairly small details. So some cost stages have less than £1,000 in them, but we're still showing them in the accounts because it's interesting to know how you're performing against budget. I think at the moment, the concern is there's this big pot that's just labelled up, if you like, gross profit wages. Yeah. And you know, people, it's, we're saying as, as members of the trust, yeah. um, well, that just hides so many things. We don't yeah. know what goes on. Yeah. We don't know what's happening. So if there is more detail available, and I'm sure that we keep room ask for more and more detail. Why don't you enter the yeah. <coughs> There's more information, as, as you said over there, it would help to head off. 
I, I, think, I think you would find it useful to compare um, different departments' uh, wage bills and, uh, and equally to see them year on year. Yeah. Because what you would for certain see this year is that all of the hiking wages and salaries is in the players budget because the money's been allowed to do that. There's no more than inflation increase across any other department. I will say, because if you're looking at cash flow pinch points, the wages are fixed, but your expenses are very Absolutely. So yes. your expenses you yeah. can Well, it, you won't be surprised to find that all of the pinch points on the cash flow are the day that wages are paid. Because <laughs> that's the biggest cost of the club. And of course, that's one that you can't not make. Does the, does the club pay the living wage or the minimum wage? The club pays the minimum wage and it obviously has to have a plan in place. All we have is a number of employees who are actually, it's their secondary employment. Yeah. So whether that be a student, whether it be a member of class staff, the number of staff that it comes as their secondary employment. However, of course, it has to have a plan over the next few years to actually step that up over time. And that will come at significant cost to the club. Yeah. So that, that's part of the budgeting process that we need, now need to look at over the next three years and work out how we get to that. And that's the living range wage as defined by the government, which is different to the yeah, to living wage as, as, as has been yeah. campaigned for. Yeah, but I think as a trust owned club with the community, we should be being paid the living wage as yeah. soon as possible. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a debate which is complicated, I think, by having a number of people in secondary employment, volunteers who perhaps then feel cheated that there's people doing work who are getting paid, paid more. And I know on a much bigger scale that Celtic Football Club is having this exact debate and problem at the moment being lobbied by a number of MPs to pay the living wage, and they're pointing out what they're aiming to in the number of volunteers and secondary and uh, non-contract workers should we be paying the living wage to everyone? Of course we should. Would it be as expensive as the 50 grand we slipped over on the plane budget to you know, the people that are on minimum wage to make that up the living wage? Would that be as expensive as the 50 grand we slipped over the plane budget? You know? Probably not on an annual basis. Yeah, I've, I've, I've no feel for the numbers, I have to say. I've not, I've not looked at it, but... <laughs> It's, it's a lot of it's a lot of increases, isn't it, to, to pay for fifty grand? Yeah. Yeah. We, we, Lawrence and I did some work before, um, and we looked at the figures. There are a number of different ways you can look at it and how it impacts on the body. It's either going to be one of three things: it's either going to put prices up because in this model, as you can as you've heard tonight, there is there isn't a massive profit that we're going to chop away at, and it would be um, foolish to take that into a loss. So it's either going to come into there, <coughs> um, so it's going to take prices up, it's either going to have less staff, or alternatively it's going to come out of the planning budget, you know, or through other cost savings within the club. But the major cost to it is going to be the planning budget, so effectively it could come out, it would end up coming out of there, if it couldn't be managed within other lines. I think one of the other debates about the living wage is, is it better to employ more than one person on a lesser wage, you give two people a job, or pay one person more. Um, I think there's been that, you know, a lot of, there are a lot of clubs, or some clubs, I think, who have promoted the living wage because it is publicity-wise very useful for them. And they are clubs who have perhaps had, I mean, Luton, Luton Town, who have had issues over the governance and the way that they're run previously. <coughs> I think we even went public about the living wage because that actually suited them as a publicity statement as well. It might suit us in terms of encouraging people to sign up for the trust, though. It might be another sort of string to the bow of the trust. So yeah. Just, yeah. 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 David, you'll give us quite a, quite a list of uh, of, well, notes and statements and observations. Have you any other questions that you want answering out of your uh, your? Well, no. I I asked three. Um, my paper and I asked for salaries, expenses, and all payments made to first of all the members of the board of directors, secondly the football manager, thirdly the director of football. Then I yeah. went on to explain in my paper the grounds for that request, which I think are reasons. I've gone on to say. 
uh, I don't believe there are reasonable grounds for refusal to disclose on the basis of prejudice and commercial interests and stuff. I've looked at the statements on the club website, I've looked at the statements on the trust website, and then I've made some observations. I mean, my, the reason I've <coughs> taken the time and effort to put forward that paper is to in reinvigorate the trust, not to undermine it. Yeah. Because I do detect, and Florence, I think, makes the point in his um, paper to the AGM, which I've looked at, um, that there is a disconnect has arisen between the trust, the supporters, and the club. Uh, we don't get sufficient nominations for the board of society. Gates are falling. So there are, those are indications of how people react to situations where they believe that there, there isn't what they what they would like to see when it comes to financial transparency. And what happens is the vast majority of people walk away. Well, apathy is not acquiescence. You understand what I'm talking about. You're a financial director. Yeah, I haven't seen any figures today. And I was a bit disturbed when you said you hadn't got a feel for the numbers. I suspect that was a colloquial expression on your part. But it was a particular number that were living wage, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, but yeah. I haven't got a feel for the number of employees who were on minimum wage rather than living wage. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, that was a tri comment. I, I, I withdraw it. But at the end of the day, when I come to a football match, I have to go to a turnstile and I have to pay. Absolutely. I recognise that. When my wife goes to the supermarket and she gets to the, the, the till, she has to pay. We all have to pay our way. But and I look at the second part of the document that was sent to me, turnover, and it says <coughs> sterling work done last year, um, the first supporter sponsors game for Sir Burton Albion was a huge success, and we want to match or even beat last year's total of £3,749. I know, I've shaken buckets in the past, it's very difficult in the world in which we live, particularly in this country, when people think things are free, when in reality they're not. Yeah. And we might discuss what they are. But when you compare that £3,749 with figures like <coughs> $3.8 million, yeah. I think I'm right to say, and that isn't a disparity comment, the two figures when you compare, they're dropping, 3749 is a drop in the ocean. Yeah, absolutely. And I genuinely believe that the information I've asked is not unreasonable in the circumstances that I'm laid out in my paper. That doesn't preclude either the board or the trust from saying that they're not going to be made available. That's their privilege. But I wouldn't wish to encourage any more apathy amongst people. I, I sit in the part of the stand where in reality there's only two of us left in the two rows uh, of what there were five or six years ago. Now that, that isn't just as a matter of team performance. And another point made by someone at the AGM, which I thought was very valid, and it wasn't one I picked up on, someone said it about, I don't know who it was, look around you, there was no one below the age of 40 years old at the AGM. And the club will depend upon young people. Absolutely. And, and I think, me, that's, I think that's, that's, a that's a point which I specifically, or a concern that I specifically mentioned in the report, that I gave is reaching out to a new generation of sort of Supporters. There are a generation of supporters who have grown up knowing nothing but our club being trust owned. And I suspect there is a set, well, I think the trust board are guilty of not reaching out to them on the one, on the one hand and demystifying the workings of the trust and making it more accessible to young people. But I think there are a lot of young people who just take the model for granted don't, aren't perhaps driven by that fear that us older ones had about what happened when we were owned and run by some uh, less than um, less than perfect people. Uh, it's some anyway, I, 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 my paper says it all. Yeah. I've said all I want to say. <coughs> okay, it's fine. entirely a matter for the club and the trust as to how they decide to respond to my formal request. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Fine. I think I, I would say w just just one other thing and. Um, and that is, the football world is a completely different world to what it was 20 years ago. And I think we're, we're all, I'm sure, privately frustrated that, that the cost of putting a team out on the pitch now is so much more than it was before. And that's nobody's fault in this room or in the boardroom or anywhere else. It's just the way the game has evolved. 
the strength that the agents have, the money that Sky and others have put into the game, which has just fed <coughs> footballers' wages. And, and that is the, you know, that is a real difficulty now that that everybody who, who, who goes onto a professional football field to play expects to earn a lot of money for doing that. Um, and we've just got to live with that and do the, the best we can to fund this. But, um, you know, there's, there's no going back on it now, is there? I think one of the most important things from the stability of the club, and I realise that if I was a supporter of the National League side, I'm, I may be of a different opinion to that, but recently at the Football League, they, they voted through changes to the parachute payments to the club coming out of the Football League into the conference. And you look down at the clubs that used to be our opponents in Aldershot and in Torquay, you know, and how they're struggling to survive in the conference. What happened was um, a Football League meeting uh, probably 18 months ago now, we looked at the process, and pretty much every League Two club in there was fearful of what would happen to them in the event of relegation. Of course, there's a few that the chairman just says, I'll put in more money. But actually, the majority of the group were, were all of the opinion that it would bring huge financial struggles for their clubs. So the changing that you might have read in the press, that um, we get two parts of funding from the Solidarity from the Premier League, which used to be a gift and is now contractual from a Premier League to all Championship League 1 and League 2 clubs on a sliding scale. But in addition to that, we get central funding from the Football League. And so you lost your solidarity immediately on relegation to the National League. But in addition to that, your league money dropped by 50% in year 1 and in year 2 you got zero. So immediately the clubs couldn't adjust. And that's what's happened to, I guess, without knowing the full details. Talky and Eldershot, you can't change your common base overnight like that. So the change in the parachute payment is a huge benefit. Of course we want to look upwards and let's hope that we go upwards in, in terms of moving this division, not downwards. However, it's a massive safety net, but it's a huge improvement because otherwise every club is simply gambling on its on its future and this is a massive step forward. I just pick up on one point that Keith made about where the power lies in the game now. I mean, agents undoubtedly play a much more crucial role. But one of the difficulties, and I'm picking up on the theme of the budget and the playing budget, is that, if I understand it correctly, players who are out of contract at, an end of, at the end of a season can sign a pre-contract agreement with another club before January. Yeah, come January, they can sign this. In January, January when they've got yeah, the project, in January, but they can sign the pre-contract agreement then. And the difficulty that um, gives the playing budget is does the manager get his budget and spend it? Or does the manager keep money back on the basis that an agent will come to the club and say, so and so is going to sign a pre contract agreement in January with another club, unless you offer in extra money, the contract starts now. So that extra money comes, the player will want a contract in January to be tempted to stay at a club if he says, actually, if not, I'm going to sign <coughs> a pre contract agreement with another club. The difficulty there is. If the manager spends all his budget, he's got nothing to <coughs> negotiate with the agent for. If he doesn't spend all his budget, he can be accused then of not utilising the money he's got to make his, uh, his playing squad as strong as it could poss possibly be. And I think that is perhaps just one example of the power that agents have that shouldn't be underestimated. Is that why then? We've paid £23,000 in the last year to agents yeah. where we don't pay a penny to players. And I wonder where the heck that came from because we're not buying anybody so where they get involved. Yeah. Probably I don't like that at all. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't think any of us like it, but it, it, it's the world we're in, isn't it? You know, they've got stronger and stronger so virtually agents. Virtually, the club has been blackmailed by it the is. agent. Every club's been blackmailed by an agent somewhere. Probably every day of the week. I think the market falls rather than you. Yeah. Well, are we allowed to yeah. are we allowed to or can we oh, just show yes, that breakdown yeah. of those fees as to whether they've been paid by the club or paid by the club on behalf of players so split it out to two figures because that 
that, that phrase there sort of makes me think, well, again, I know it's a relatively small amount, but it's just that openness again about saying what we're actually paying or what we're just acting as a, a bank account for. Uh, well, I, 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 well, I, I don't know what they're very, very clear to distinct um, separate rooms mm -hmm. uh, in terms of those two treatments and how they work. But in terms of the, the disclosure, it's a statutory way it's disclosed by every league club. Right. And we have to do it to meet the requirements of the league. We so we, we, we met the requirements. Can we go that extra step to say we'll actually show it as I two will, events? I will ask when we attend football league meetings on Monday, I'll ask Sean Harvey um, whether we're allowed to get this done. Okay, thank you. Before I come to you, the gentleman next to you in the yellow shirt had his hand up early. Can I tell that question first? Yeah, I just want to go back to Lawrence's point about um, <coughs> young people. Obviously, I'm a young person, relatively young person for, for the crowd last year. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and obviously, you mentioned about trying to engage with young people who are taking for granted what the club offers. Um, I'm actually a student at the university, so presumably you're talking about people that are growing up here. Now, you know, I'm coming to this meeting, and I appreciate I'm probably the only student at the university that's here, but actually, I think you'd be surprised like how um, engaging with the students on campus, how, how big of a difference that can make in the long term. For instance, I know the Santa Dash last year happened after the term had finished, whereas the year before I was responsible personally for organising a group of only 20 students to go down. But I know for a fact that 10 of those students then regularly started going to matches after Christmas. And I think it's little things like that and actually trying to engage with students on campus rather than completely ignoring them. Because um, let's be honest, if you're, you know, um, a uh, child growing up with a parent that likes football, they're probably going to bring you along anyway. But at the university, you've got thousands of people coming through every year who actually, you know, I mean, a lot of those people will love football, but, you know, myself, I'm wearing a, a Woking shirt at the moment. Um, you know, Exeter's not my first team, but actually, I love football and I want to come and watch football. And, you know, I've come to these meetings and, and get involved and, and, and that sort of thing. And I think, you know, it seems to me, and I know the club has been on campus this term, but it seems to me that the university's just kind of brushed off. I don't know whether that's because it's well, these people aren't here in the long term, therefore they're not going to make a difference. But, you know, I might only be able to contribute a little amount in terms of, um, you know, uh, being a trust member at the moment. But hopefully next year I graduate, and even if I move away, I hopefully will get a job where actually I might be able to up that. And I think you find that a lot of students, if you can engage with them and actually bring them into the club, um, okay. yeah. I, I'm going to pass on to my colleague in there who was on campus and I think helped to organise the recent match where discounts were given. I think given. Thank you, Will, and you're, you're right. So I think we've learned our lesson. So this year we, we did do Freshers Week um, and got 60 people interested. We gave out vouchers at the varsity game. We had 160, I think, people that came back for the Crawley game. People we wouldn't have had otherwise. And I think there are moves afoot to, and there are student reps, two student reps haven't you got, which and the club are in contact with those every week for offers. And I think that the next thing we're doing is to offer our space downstairs for rehearsals. For, so we're, we're trying. You know, we've got, we're low base, but we're working on it. And our regular student prices are cheap. Not just the young ones, don't get the old ones. <laughs> we were, we were How rocked, we forget? How we we were rocked two years ago. Well, we do we do things like senior reds, but no one comes and talks to us about any deals. One other thing is, um, we're engaging with the university as a carol concert on Monday the seventh of December. So that's on, on here on our three meetings so far and we normally get in the region of two, two and a half thousand people. So we're trying to engage but if you've got ideas by all means, contact Elaine and myself and the other part goes on because it's finding the right route in that hit the spot. Right. One final question, mate. I know this may be going off the accounts a little bit, but going back to the players and the pre contract of, of, of agreements that they can make in January, I may be living in a, a, maybe a fantasy world, but it seems to me that over the years we have taken on board a number of players at this club who have been fairly desperate at the time of signing on. But their careers have been in much better shape and they've moved on from us uh, and been quite well for themselves. At the time that we signed players on, could we not, I mean, would it be uh, against contractual law to actually uh, have a clause in their contract that they will not sign a pre contract arrangement for the clubs whilst they are here? So I don't, I don't think you're, you're allowed. It's, it, unfortunately, the PM, so players have one, aim, have one union called the PFA, which brings a huge amount of power. And, um, and yeah, so 
unfortunately the pressures of that are great. In addition to that, as a club, we have to. Um, some of the contracts are getting very difficult <coughs> in terms of the conditions and the, the uplifts involved should they play a number of games to give us that flexibility going forward. But linking back to, I think Roger um, made the point about being able to turn off the cap. Our contracts, at the moment, I think we've got one contract that runs into 16, 17, but other than that, everything else is, is running, running up either this season or next season. So keeping the flexibility, and it is probably, I don't think it's the most difficult thing for this, but it's very difficult to try and have the availability to strike and make the contact with regards to contract. Each and every player is different in terms of how they receive the contract off or when they're likely to sign it. But trying to get that player to sign when they're at their lowest ebb to, you know, that they're not looking for the move away where they're going to triple their money is, is a challenge in the game. So, Tiz does that very well. Um, he's in constant contact with the board. He comes to uh, bi monthly board meetings to update them on that because it's a very fluid process. I was in construction as well, so you understand what I'm saying that our, our contracts can be huge and yeah. probably like very complicated yeah. employment contracts. And it was once said that the Rolling Stones could do a world tour on two sides of a piece of paper. Yeah. Just to see the context where it, 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 it you, you can't do that with a football contract. No. Yeah. Right, final. Oh, Can I ask one, you one quick one? Go on, uh, this is on behalf of someone who posted on, on x -ray. The league publish every year a list of player budgets and where we stand in it and an okay. anonymised form. Okay. Where will we be for 14 15 and where will we be for 15 16? I don't know, but I can find out. Possibly you Justin know. from there. Okay. I would, but off the top of my head, Roger, I couldn't tell you. We'll certainly be in, I would, without the Grimes money, we were in the bottom quarter mm -hmm. in terms of League Two clubs and what we spend on players. That's a qualifying spend on over 21s, I think it is, forgive me, but this is a broad kind of approach. We, we do spend differently in terms of the playing budget as a whole. So whether it's a young player or whether it's a coach, this can choose how he spends that money. Yeah. So we slice it up slightly differently, but we sound well in the bottom quarter position. I, I think, yeah, you make a good point there. To, to just to clarify, the playing budget is, is Paul's budget, so it includes coaches, physios, and the like. It's not just the players. It's not exactly a like for like comparison. Probably not. If you look at our figures on there, it's probably not a like for like comparison with the league table. And but the 55% rule, what, that you're allowed to spend on players, what does that include? And where are we on? I'm afraid I'm going to pass yeah. that sideways. So what, what it works on is um, you have headroom then, rather than, so you work 80% digitally and you have headroom. So part of the process when it came to the Grimes one that I was concerned about was actually that under the rules of the playing budget, um, that actually would be stumped because the money would go in <coughs> from a financial point of view last year, mm -hmm. and therefore it, we wouldn't be able to spread that load. In fact, the, the, the rules on it are based on receipts, and we, we did some work, didn't we, John? We probably need to follow that up and try and get a report mm -hmm. out for clarification. It's noticeable actually that the league have taken off their website the paragraphs that persuade the rules for the sorry, cost of money. Uh, uh, Sometimes that's wise. Sorry, well, yes. It may be uh, so inadvertent, but it may be visible. So, so, so you've said that Tisdale's budget is everything, but the 55% mm -hmm. the 55 only applies to players' wages, transfer fees, loan fees in and out, transfers in and out, and some expenses, including agents. It doesn't apply to coaching, it doesn't apply to management. So, yeah, that's what I wasn't sure if that would have come out. So, how can okay. someone come in and this guy, Forrest Green, because they've got a 55% interest in the conference? No, they're open on the conference. Well, it's abolished playing budget. No, they have now. Oh, right. They, I was it flying and we were now. So, it, it was at the time. Okay, now yeah. doing the return. Okay. Right. However, <laughs> since then, what they've done is, is wiped it away and said that it must be. Um, proving that they can find any projected loss. Okay. So in this instance, presumably the bank statement is, is the proof that they take. Because yeah, the 55% includes two things. It includes the expenditure on wages and the qualifying internally. Mm -hmm. One of the ways around some players, some clubs have done is to, if you've got a rich owner who owns a construction company, you call it the Joe Bloggs 
stand and give up two hundred and fifty thousand pounds a year in sponsorship. Oh, oh right. Yeah. Yeah. So that ups the turnover. So that ups the turnover. So I was just saying, well, there's various ways. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Thank you. It's cats and skinny cats. And mm -hmm. Okay. I think I want to say, just want to say, I find this really useful this evening, and it's good to hear from. Obviously, always going to happen that we can't make the agency to that. Yeah. Can we try and we get a, a, get a, a deputy, somebody who can come along and answer the questions? Um, because it, it, I came away from the AGM feeling very frustrated. Yeah. Because I, I felt we've gone back. I, I think it's fair to say that it, it won't happen in future. It just happened that I joined the club in July. I got a holiday booked for the time of the AGM, so I couldn't do anything about it. And yeah. I would, you know, it was going to be. Um, Wilson was going to come. Yeah, was, and he, yeah, but, yeah, but my deputy at South West Highways, who helps with the football club, was going to come, and his brother died, who lives in Canada, the week before the AGM. Yeah. So it, I, I'm absolutely certain in future that either myself or David will be at the AGM. Yeah, I'll, I'll speak to um, Lawrence and Nick, but if, if there's any possibility of holding the AGM on this side, I'm, I'm available on a match day, but actually to go down to the field or something like that. Yeah, I think well, can I thank Justin and thank Justin <coughs> because I think, as the boy from Leeds has acquitted himself well, um, I'm going to stay. There's a raffle, and I please need, encourage you to buy raffle tickets to use the bar. Rather than coming back up to the table afterwards and facing you, I'm going to stay for the next half an hour or hour. I'm happy to mingle and answer questions. Um, I had a bit of a pop of agents earlier on. I should say a lot of agents of colleagues of mine in the legal profession. We've had a word said against them. Thank you very much.